On this episode of Law Weekly, we bring you some of the highlights from the Justice Sector Summit organized by the Nigerian Bar Association and the Justice Research Institute in collaboration with the National Judicial Council, the Conrad Adenai Foundation, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, UNODC, and the Justice Reform Project. Also showing on the program, updates from the Corona's inquest into the controversial death of late Sylvester Romani Jr., plus a recap of some of the top legal stories. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Shola Shoyeli. Nigeria ranks 121 out of 139 countries on the Rule of Law Index of the World Justice Project, WJP 2021. The WJP scores nations on eight factors, including the state of the criminal and civil justice system, where it measures whether judicial officers are competent and produce speedy decisions. It also measures the accessibility, impartiality, and effectiveness of the judiciary and other alternative dispute resolution mechanisms. Sadly, the Nigerian justice sector continues to fall short of expectations. It's for these reasons and more that key stakeholders in the sector gathered in Abuja, the nation's capital, for a one-day summit aimed at addressing the most pressing challenges confronting the Nigerian justice sector. How do we stem the tide? Though physical attendance at the summit was limited in adherence to the COVID-19 guidelines, a lot more people joined online. The summit had the theme, devising practical solutions towards improved performance, enhance accountability and independence in the justice sector. Participants here include the vice president, other lawyers who are members of the executive, justices of the Supreme Court, heads of other courts, the president of the Nigerian Bar, past presidents of the Bar, senior advocates, as well as other senior and junior lawyers. It's a fine blend of critical stakeholders, stakeholders who acknowledge that a one-day summit cannot address all the challenges confronting the justice sector, and issues have been narrowed to three broad but interrelated challenges of judicial appointment, rethinking judicial administration, and accelerating the speed of justice delivery. The NBA president sets the tone for the conversation with these comments. The question we must ask ourselves today is simple. What is stopping us from providing justice to our people? And what, what must we do to change it? If we are to effect the change, we must make a vision in this summit and commit to implementing them. The reforms we must commit to are statutory and constitutional reforms, and also institutional and, and manpower reforms. The lip service that we have paid to these reforms over the years must stop from today. In ending, ladies and gentlemen, it is pertinent to note that there is one reality we often overlook, but which lies at the heart of everything we do in the justice delivery sector of this country. There is no judicial officer in Nigeria that was called to the bench. Every single one was first called to the bar because ultimately, before ultimately making their way to the bench, in my opinion, therefore, we have paid far too much heed to the phony bar and bench divide that we have all become accustomed to and have allowed to sow deep-seated divisions that have only succeeded in hampering the effectiveness of the justice sector in Nigeria. Again, it, it is my hope that today marks the beginning of the end to this distinction that really does not exist. The representative of the Chief Justice of Nigeria, a Justice of the Supreme Court, Justice John E. Angokoro, dwelt on judges' performance, evaluation and monitoring, delay of justice, underfunding, and judicial appointments. As a service-oriented institution, the judiciary is neither transigent or intransigent nor blind to the need for improvement in the current appointment process. To this end, the National Judicial Council has already set up a committee to review the judicial appointments process. Similarly, a committee had also been constituted to review the NJC Form A, which contains the biodata and other critical information of candidates shortlisted for judicial office. These committees 
have reached advanced stage in this task. Related to that is the fact that our judicial officers are poorly paid. Statistics show that even a magistrate in the United States of America earns more than the Chief Justice of Nigeria. Even judges of the Ghanaian judiciary earn more than ours. The Nigerian judiciary is the only judiciary in the whole world where the judiciary remains stagnant from the day of appointment to the date of the division of our retirement. This cannot be right. Another Justice of the Supreme Court, Justice Amina Oge, in her keynote address, alluded to the frank conversations ahead when she said this. All of us know without exception that the judiciary is the favorite whipping boy when everything wrong with the justice sector. Nobody looks to see the others, the judiciary, the judges, the courts, where the main, uh, where the, everything wrong is our fault. It's all from us. So what am I supposed to say? What am I supposed to do? Uh, but I do know that the accusing fingers are pointed at us, but I'm not going to be the one to begin to lay it all out uh, here. By the time we listen to all the criticisms, all the faults, everything that they have to say about how the judiciary have messed this country up, it's not going to be a pleasant experience for all of us judicial officers. That I can assure you. It's not a pleasant experience. Not just for us judicial officers. We are the main culprits, as you would say. Other stakeholders as well. I know some SANs will get under fire. Even our able vice president will they say under his watch, how can such a thing happen? So he's going to face his own fire as well. I mean, we are all going to be blamed. But that's what we're here for. That's what we're here for. So the message I'm trying to say is, hey, let's face the music. The time must come when we must unearth everything and bring out the rot. It's like an abscess. Devising practical solutions towards improved performance, enhanced accountability and independence in the justice sector is the first session up for discussion. And Justice Oge joins the panelists for the conversation, which is moderated by former president of the bar, Dr. Olisa Agbakoba. First was the issue of the role of the NJC on appointment of judges, where the moderator noted that the bench strongly moved against the appointment of senior lawyers to the Supreme Court. Just to say that the 2014 NJC rules are not being followed. Because those rules talk about transparency, publishing uh, uh, names, and I listened very carefully to my Lord Justice John Inyang Okoro. I listened very carefully to you, and I disagree, unfortunately, because the rules that have been laid out are not quite being followed. Because if they were, then the bar would have representation in the Supreme Court, I would have thought. There would be a better spread. The bar had nominated a couple of people to go to the Supreme Court, but that was mightily resisted, mightily resisted. The Attorney General and Minister of Justice speaks more on this issue and the role of the executive to strengthen the judicial process. He challenged the judiciary to be more transparent and accountable and more importantly to open up its books for scrutiny. The first bottleneck arising from the appointment of judicial officers is indeed embedded in the guidelines associated with the appointment of judicial officers. Now, again, if you are looking for integrity associated with the system, there has to be some innovations, a filtering process that will allow for scrutiny of the personalities and integrity of the officers to be appointed. So from the perspectives of appointment, if you want to enhance on the quality of the system, there has to be some accommodation of merit as a basis for consideration as against developing guidelines that will technically knock out all others from coming into the system, for example. Now, if you are talking of the funding of the judiciary, I think the starting point 
is to imbibe the spirit of transparency and accountability. And that you can only achieve if the books are open. Now as it is, for example, a budgetary provision, I think of about 104 billion has been provided for the judiciary in the national budget. Less amount is provided for the legislature. But the National Assembly is living comfortably in terms of salary allowances and welfare of the members of the National Assembly. But the issue is, why is the 104 billion provided in the budget not sufficient for judiciary? We are not in a position to answer. Why? Because the books are not open. And the fundamental question is, how much is it that is provided to the judiciary? How is it applied? And then to what extent is the welfare of the judicial officers considered in the allocation through judicial process? The executive is not in a position to say. And until and unless we allow the operation of an open government partnership arrangement that will allow the books of the legislature the books of the judiciary, and indeed the books of the executive to be open, we can never be in a position to identify to what extent the budgetary provision made is inadequate and to what extent it is applied for the purpose of ensuring that the welfare of the judges is adequately addressed. Those comments from the AGF attracted these interventions the from the moderator. I think the role of a judge, my father was a judge, I never heard him talk about money. Never. He sat in court. Never, ever. It was the chief registrar. So I think the time has come as one of the practical solutions to think about separating. Let the judges robe and go and sit. Go and sit in court. Leave money to those who can administer it. And from the legislature. We almost had a running battle on the, I mean, I am a, an item in the list. And then that item is talking about overtime for staff running into hundreds and tens of millions. And then we questioned the court and said, why would you pay overtime to staff in a COVID year where almost half of the staff were asked to stay at home? And so I love this issue that we are raising about the transparency. And when we stood our ground, myself and my Senate counterpart to want to do what was right, there was no blackmail. We did not get it within the system that we are fighting the judiciary. And some people would approach us, you know, you are a politician. You appear before the court one day. I said, no. For God's sake, what has to be done has to be done. We are talking about um, more funding for the judiciary. Unfortunately, they, uh, we have 17 trillion as national budget this year. And the percentage of the money given to judicial, 110 billion. I appreciate, Mr. President, for the increase since 2009, adding 10 billion in 2000, I mean 2019, and I mean 2000, 2020, 2000, 2019, 2020, and 2022 budget. It's quite, we appreciate Mr. President for that effort. But if we look at the totality today, 17 trillion naira budget, and the judiciary has 110 billion, that is 0.7% of the national budget. And that's why at the legislature, we started a campaign for a special intervention fund. I, I, I saw that reflected in the speech of the MBA president as what is obtainable in India. The judiciary, I mean, the judiciary submitted a budget of about 187 billion to the executive, and then the, the executive in their wisdom pruned it and then brought it to, I think, about uh, 110 for our uh, under disability transfer. Is there a possibility? I know that we are not trying to take the powers of executive. Is there a possibility for um, still independent of the judiciary, for the judiciary to submit its budget directly to the National Assembly, directly to the National Assembly, so that the National Assembly, started with the responsibility of appropriation, can look at this uh, budget? And directly. The legislature says it's also considering these other issues. The other one is the issue of financing. It's quite, um, I would say, unfortunate that the law, the legislation making uh, for the provision of uh, emolument, entitlement, 
for judicial officers is tied with that of political office holders. And so most times, any attempt at seeking to um, make some amendment and then making for uh, increase in uh, maybe entitlement salaries of uh, judicial office holders is being seen as an attempt by politicians to equally increase their salaries. We are seeking to have a, a, a separate legislation where the condition of service, the emolument and the salaries of the judicial officers is dealt with in a legislation of, of, of its own. The opening panel also touched on practical solutions for the speed of justice and efficiency of the sector. The president of the bar noted that while open books are desirable, the judiciary's autonomy is non-negotiable. Coming to this summit, the, the, um, the bar is quite resolved. We're resolved in our determination to deal with the issues headlong. And I keep on saying that we refuse to be a rubber stamp in the process. Uh, we're not there to fill up numbers. Now, appearing at the NJC for the first time, I, I was stunned by some of the things that I heard and I saw. But it also was also good because I could look at the issues with a fresh set of eyes, not really be clouded by uh, antecedents in the courtroom, which I don't have anymore. So, the issue of appointments. When I saw the process by which uh, justice of the Court of Appeal, potential justice of the Court of Appeal were about to be selected, so I asked questions. Okay, before this 20 or so, 40 or so applicants, let me call them applicants, got here, what process did they go through? I am told that at the Court of Appeal level, the President of the Court of Appeal uh, would empanel a committee that would take some names or get names or get uh, persons who have been recommended. And those, the list will be looked at by the committee. Uh, three minutes, okay. Uh, we looked at by the committee. And the the next step is that the recommendations are made and the names are sent to the Federal Judicial Services uh, Commission. And then the Federal Judicial Services Commission, there they look at a federal character. Where is this one from? Where is that one from? Rearrange the list. Send it to the NJC. Then the list gets, gets to the NJC. So I asked the question. I said, so these applicants, this is the first time they're actually being talked to, to find out if... Uh, find out about competence and all of that. And at that particular instance, we had maybe all of six minutes to talk to each applicant. Some were told to take a bow and go. Some will be asked, you know, I, what I consider to be perfunctory questions, because there's not enough time. And then that is how they will emerge. That has a direct bearing on efficiency. That has a direct bearing on how the courts will run. Let's go to the high court. Those who are going to the high courts, how do they emerge? Some states conduct interviews, like Lagos. Some are Anjigawa. Some don't. So the list is now put together, sent to the NJC. Again, they come and meet this appointment committee to which I, I belong and which you sat on when you were president. And then they are interviewed for two minutes, three minutes, maybe five, or not at all. And then a list, is, uh, a list emerges and uh, a judge emerges. You are a judge. And I said to myself, it may have worked when your father was a judge. Where you say, that's a very good at, uh, lawyer, good counsel. He's good enough. We, we vouch for him. It can't work now. Second point, funding has a bearing on efficiency of the system. If the judiciary is not, I agree, the books must be open. The books must be open. But firstly, the judiciary must be independent and autonomous as far as its funding is concerned. Then we put the responsibility. We put the responsibility on those who superintend the process because what I find is that when I talk to judges who are not yet heads of court, they say one thing. When they become heads of court, it's a totally different conversation. After the opening plenary of the summit, Vice President Yemi Oshibajo gives his comments. He wants the process of appointment of judges to be more rigorous, with emphasis on merit, so the best hands will emerge. In the United Kingdom, from where we derive most of the structures of our judicature, applicants to judicial office in superior courts go through several screening processes. At some point, it was 17 stages. 
including written examinations, interviews, role play exercises. They are subjected to rigorous background investigation. And in the US, of course, with many of us, even who are not participants in the process, watch how Supreme Court appointments or appointees are rigorously screened by the Senate, which sifts through the entire public and sometimes private lives of the candidates. That is the nature of the rigor that anyone who should hold uh, the power of life and death and the power over other people's livelihoods should go through. That is the rigor that you should go through. It shouldn't be a bowing, it shouldn't be a take a bow situation at all. And while we ask for the best from our judicial officers, we must equally ensure that the conditions under which they operate are not only befitting, but they are good enough to attract the best minds in our profession. Why should a judge earn so much less than a federal legislator? Why? I mean, there's no basis for it whatsoever. We should, in fact, benchmark without necessarily creating fresh legislation, because the legislature don't have any legislation about their own salaries. There's no need to create any fresh legislation. Before we say, if we benchmark what a federal judicial officer, if we benchmark what the Court of Appeal judge earns, to what the House of Representatives legislator, such as uh, uh, Honorable Luke Ernst, if we benchmark it, you will find that it's a startling difference. It's a difference between maybe 600,000 and 8 million. I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible. And benchmark uh, the Supreme Court justices to what the Senate, uh, to what the Senator earns. If we start that quick process now, we will not need to go through the rigors of any legislation. Welcome back. You've heard some of the conversations from the Justice Summit 2022, which I dare say is a bold move by stakeholders to fix the problems in the justice sector. On subsequent episodes of the program, we'll bring you more from that summit, and you can be sure that we'll track and follow closely the implementation of recommendations from the summit as a way of making participants and all stakeholders in the justice sector accountable. And just before we go, let's quickly bring you a recap of some of the top stories from the courtrooms. We begin with the report that the Federal High Court sitting in Abuja has barred the federal government from deducting funds from the Federation account to fund the Nigerian police force and other agencies not listed in the Constitution. On Wednesday, January the 26th, Justice Ahmed Mohammed declared the deductions as unconstitutional and ordered that all money deducted from the Federation account belonging to River State be refunded to the state. He made the pronouncement in a judgment on a suit filed by the River State government against the Attorney General of the Federation and Minister of Justice, the Accountants General of the Federation, the Revenue Mobilization, Allocation and Fiscal Commission, and the Federal Ministry of Finance. In Akwaibom State, another federal high court has fixed February the 24th for adoption of written addresses for a no-case submission in a three-count charge bordering on announcing and publishing false election results preferred by the Independent National Electoral Commission against Professor Ignatius Uduk. Professor Ignatius Uduk, a lecturer in the University of Uyo, was engaged by INEC as collation returning officer for SCN Udim State constituency in March 9, 2019 governorship and House of Assembly elections. In Lagos, the family of the late Darwin College student, Sylvester Oromoni Jr., has asked the coroner inquiring into his controversial death to adjourn proceedings indefinitely. A counsel from the law firm of Falano and Falano made the application on the grounds that other parties to the proceedings have not filed their witness depositions. The coroner, Magistrate Mikhail Kadiri, has held that the application is vexatious, especially as the court has ruled on the matter and ordered all parties to file their witness deposition by Tuesday, February the 1st. And we round off with yet another coroner's inquest, this time that of the four-score Ikoyi Collapse Building in Lagos, where the State Emergency Management Agency, LASEMA, has insisted that none of the victims died during the rescue operations. The Director General, Chief Executive Officer of LASEMA, Dr. Oluwafemi Oke Osoitolu, 
told the coroner, Magistrate Oyetade Komolafe, that the use of drone and the equipment for detection of life enabled both primary and secondary emergency responders to determine that there was no life in the debris before work commenced. The 21-storey high-rise building, located at Gerard Road, Ikoyi, Lagos, was said to have resulted in the death of 46 persons, one of whom was the MD of Four Score Heights Limited, who also died in the building collapse. That's the program this week. Many thanks for watching. Please catch up with past episodes on our YouTube page. I'm Shola Shirley. See you next week.